Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, this week, we're going to be reading this book together, A Thousand Miles. Now, each night, you're going to have a chapter two to read. So I wanted to start off with uh, a recording of the first two chapters, because these really set the stage, set the groundwork for what we're going to be discussing here in class. And this is by an author named Precious McKenzie. Uh, and as you can see from the first page, you have two young boys. Uh, it looks like they're running. There's a dog. Uh, but we really don't have a whole lot of background as to what uh, what's going on. So let's begin. Chapter one, Trouble in Washington. The April sun shone through the Senate windows in Washington, D.C. statesmen in starch suits argued heatedly among themselves. They are an inferior race and can be moved from the state of Georgia. After all, President Jackson supports the movement wholeheartedly, shouted Mr. Lumpkin. Besides, he continued, we need this land for development, for progress. He ended his speech with dramatic flourish, waving his arms in the air as if to emphasize the idea of progress. Disgruntled rumbles erupted from the room. Senator Sprague from Maine took to the podium. It was his turn to speak. Good sirs, Senator Sprague began. I ask you humbly to humbly consider not signing this bill. Removing Indians from their homeland does no honor to our great nation. We must act in good faith, honor our brethren, let them live peacefully on their native land. Progress and development are no substitutes for honor. Above all else, we must act honorably. Honor, who cares about honor? What about the skirmishes, the raids? A man yelled from the back of the room. Without missing a beat, Senator Sprague addressed the point. Good sir, the time of raids and skirmishes are past. It is time for both nations to live in peace and prosperity. Mr. Lumpkin jumped to his feet. Our treaties have been violated. Move the Indians to the West. States have the right to control the Indians. Give the states sovereignty. Mr. Lumpkin pumped his fist in the air. Senator Sprague interrupted. I still have the podium, Mr. Lumpkin. Hear me out. Progress, states' rights, and money should not dictate our government's policies about basic goodness and human rights. With that, the angry statesmen on both sides of the issue shouted at one another. Amid the chaos, Senator Sprague jumped to the top of the podium. His face was blotchy and red. Gentlemen, gentlemen, he yelled, take your seats, take your seats. Shocked by Senator Sprague's position on the top of the podium, the statesmen gradually calmed down. They smoothed their wigs and brushed off their coats. When all was settled, Senator Sprague finished his argument. The United States must uphold her treaty agreements, period. To do otherwise would go against all we fought for in the revolution. It is right and just to protect Indian territory from settlement and from development by white settlers. We must honor the ideals on which our nation was built. Senator Sprague returned to his seat. He looked upset and he knew he had a long battle ahead of him. By May, much to the Senator's dismay, the House of Representatives voted and passed the Indian Removal Act. Then the Senate followed. President Jackson signed the act into law. With one stroke of his pen, the president changed the destiny of Native Americans. Chapter two, breaking the news. December in Georgia, in Georgia was usually pleasant. The normally hottest fire temperatures had cooled to mild. Some evenings it was downright cold. Deuce Dew loved this time of year. He didn't start to sweat as soon as he left his cabin and the white people were friendlier too. They enjoyed the mild winter as the, and they were in the Christmas spirit. Deustu walked over to his mother's chicken pen. 12 hens of various shades danced around his mother. She was scattering cracked corn and old vegetables across the chicken yard, talking to her hens as she moved. Deustu liked watching his mother with the hens. There was something simple and just plain nice about it. His mother was a tall woman with strong arms and shining, smiling eyes. She always made him feel very loved. Mama, Deustu chirped as she approached Chicken Pen. Need some help? Hello, my love. She smiled and wiped her hands on her apron. I'll fetch their water for you, Deustu volunteered. Thank you, dear heart. Deustu jogged over to the water pump, lifted the pitcher, and pumped as hard and as fast as his small five-year-old arms would go. The water from the ground was cool fresh. After filling the pitcher, he carefully walked back to the pen. As he poured the fresh water in the dish, he said, Mama, Papa told me to find you. He said he had some news to share with you. News? About what? Deustu shrugged. Papa didn't say. Have you seen your sister lately? No, but she did say she wanted to walk around to town and get candy. 
She's such a silly girl. She knows she'll have to wait until Saturday, right? She can't go by herself. Dustu knew his mother was careful with money and kept the family on a tight budget. Saturday was shopping day. Treats and extras came after the staples were bought. Besides, she didn't like the children going into town by themselves. Sometimes bullies called the children names or mistreated them. Mama liked to watch over the children to make sure no nonsense happened. Mama gathered the eggs from the nest boxes. Tell Papa I'll be in soon. Just finishing my chores out here. No, Mama. He said I was to finish your work for you. He needs you right away. Mama hated to have her work interrupted. A frown crept across her face. Very well, she sighed. Rake the feathers and manure into the compost pile. Be sure to lock the pen so no raccoons get inside. She trudged to the cabin, carrying four fresh brown eggs in her hands. As Mama walked into the cabin, she could hear her two-year-old's cries. Mama! Imoka Lee wailed. Shh, 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 Papa cooed as he rocked the little girl back and forth in the rocking chair. What's the matter with Emmy? Mama asked. It must be time for a nap. No, 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 Emmy shouted and pounded her little fists on Papa's chest. Oh, yes, it is, my sweet. You are tired and very grouchy. Time to lie down. Mama took Emmy from Papa and carried her over to the small cot in the corner of the cabin. She laid the girl down. Emmy grabbed the patchwork quilt, whimpered for a few moments, then nestled her face in the quilt. She quickly dozed off. You have the magic touch, Papa laughed. Mama smiled. Years of practice. Now, what was it you needed to speak to me about? I read today's newspaper. President Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act into law. Oh no, Mama stammered. What does that mean for us? I don't really know. Chief John Ross has vowed to fight it. He wants to keep all of us in our homes, but it seems as if anything the president wants, the president gets. Where will we go? The children, what about our farm? Mama paced the cabin floor, questions raced through her mind and rolled off her tongue. Let's wait and see, have faith in the chief.